Hey, party people, welcome to tonight's SMSNA webinar. We are going to get started in about 30 seconds here. So get a comfy seat. I have my candle burning behind me to set the mood. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. They just came in. There was no one. Okay, okay awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to tonight's webinar. It started a little early there. <laughs> Get comfortable, folks. We're excited to have you with us tonight. I am comfortable in my pink slippers and my candle behind me. So we're going to set some good vibes uh, tonight for this one hour session. And we'll get started in about 30 seconds here. Haley, do you want to start us off with a couple of housekeeping items? Uh, sure can. Um, so during uh, presentations, uh, I think most people are familiar with Q&A, but if you're not, uh, you'll see the option next to the chat. Try to put any questions you have in the Q&A if you're going to type your questions, just because we don't want them to get lost in the chat. And we want to make sure we get to all your questions. Um, and then uh, unless this has changed, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we were planning to offer audio for any uh, audience yep. members that want to uh -huh. ask questions live. So you also have that option. Uh, in a minute here, Justin is gonna introduce some poll questions that we'd like all of you to answer. So just make sure you get to those while you're here with us tonight. And then uh, for anyone wondering, we will have the recording of this put up on the SMSNA members page. Awesome, thank you, Haley. My name is Amy Perlman. I'm a urologist and I specialize in quality of life concerns that affect everyday men. I'm over at the University of Iowa in good old Iowa City, Iowa. And I have two very special people with us tonight who are going to go through a lot of good content and present our, our uh, journal club article. First off, I have Justin Dubin. He is from Wayne, New Jersey. He is currently a chief resident at the University of Miami in Miami, Florida, and will be starting his fellowship in andrology this summer at Northwestern. We also have Dr. Stacy Loeb. She is from Syracuse, New York. She is professor of urology and a very proficient researcher at NY you and sees patients over at the Manhattan VA. She also hosts a Sirius XM radio show called the Men's Health Show on Sirius XM 110, and her sessions are live on Wednesday evenings. My role for tonight's session are to keep us on time. We are going to end exactly in one hour from now. My role also is to make sure that we're moving this along. If, if you kind of raise your hand or you um, make a comment, you know, we'll make sure that we get to everyone's comments. So if I cut you off, please take no offense. I just want to make sure that we keep the conversation moving. And I will also move us along between Justin and help them share slides as well as, uh, as well as Dr. Loeb. So Justin, why don't you kick us off with some polls and Haley will pull them up for you. All right, excellent. So uh, we wanted to do a couple of quick poll questions. I think there's about five questions. Uh, just Think about them now, answer them now, and it'll come later on in our discussion. The, the questions are, have you received social media usage instructions from your institution or department? Have you reviewed the AUA social media guidelines? Hold on one second. Justin, I'm cutting you off here for a second. Please, Give please. them 30 seconds to answer question number one. Oh, I mean, they can, <laughs> see, all, they can see all of them. They can see all of them. Okay, uh, okay. I'm just going to run through them. All, all. right, fine. <laughs> Sure. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, where was I? I was on three. <laughs> um, do you think that social media usage should be a formally trained aspect of resident education in the future? Do you think that it is our, meaning physicians, responsibility to be active online to combat misinformation and provide accurate information on social media? Well, and do you have or plan on using a digital strategist for social media? Take a few seconds, look over the questions, answer them as accurately as you can, and we'll get to them later, probably in the discussion aspect. And uh, we'll see, see the results. I'm excited to see what the results are for these. Can we get some music playing on in the background? What do we think? No? <laughs> <laughs> Too much to ask. <laughs> I would sing, but I don't think that's appropriate either.
All right, well, I submitted my answers. All right. Hey, Justin, why don't you share your screen and present tonight's Journal Club article? All right, let me pull it up here. And folks, I will keep an eye on the chat box. So as Justin is presenting, feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat box. And then I will verbalize some of those comments to Justin. We're trying to keep this as interactive as possible. We certainly don't want the three of us talking the entire hour. Absolutely agree. You guys can hear me. Everything's good. You can see my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. So once again, Dr. Perlman was so kind to introduce me already, but my name is Justin Dubin. I'm a urology resident over at the University of Miami. I'm going to be going to Northwestern to do my fellowship in male infertility, men's health, andrology. Um, and today is SMSNA Journal Club with a social media focus. I really wanna thank Dr. Perlman for inviting me, uh, as well as Dr. Loeb for, for a lot of the work that we've done together. Um, the, the article we're going to be discussing today is the global survey of the roles and attitudes towards social media platforms amongst urology trainees. Uh, I was the first author, Dr. Loeb is one of the PIs, and there's a lot of ur urologists involved all around the world uh, on this project, and, and we'll get to that uh, next. I do not have any disclosures. Uh, so just a quick introduction to social media, you know, starting from the first email in 1971, the internet and with it social media has really erupted over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, you know, looking at 2006, you have Twitter, then Instagram, Snapchat, and going even beyond this arrow, you can actually think about TikTok, Clubhouse. So with the progression of technology comes the progression of new forms of social media, and most of them have been here to stay. Um, and with the increase of social media use, the increased prevalence of the internet, you know, we've all been adjusting to that on a personal and professional level. And the data shows that social media usage has been on the rise by urologists over the last few years. And it has shown to have some great utility. Uh, just for some examples, for networking, uh, I took this from Jer Jeremy Teo, Dr. Jeremy Teo uh, and his Eurosomi working group. He's created an incredible online network of, of resources, of other urologists. In fact, you know, most of the people from that I published this article with, um, I've never met, I've met online. So that's just further proof of, of how, how awesome social media has been for me at least. Um, there's also been the utility of Twitter journal clubs. The Prostate Cancer Foundation has done uh, prostate cancer focused journal clubs, disseminating uh, articles, discussing articles, trying to get good conversation going on important topics, and they've been very successful. And of course, they've been a huge favorite in conferences. The last SMSNA that was in person in 2019, this is just a sample of all the tweets. Um, it's a great way to get your, your data out there. It's a great way to discuss other people's research, and it's a great way to network at, at these events. Um, so obviously there have been a lot of benefits, but not all as well in the world of social media. Hey, Justin, I'm gonna hop in here real quick. Please, Go back please. to the previous slide. Sure. So talk to us about the different social media platforms that you are involved in and the different audiences that you try to reach with each of those platforms. That's great, uh, that's a great question. So personally, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse. I don't have my own YouTube, although I have my name that I have a YouTube. I have my own Facebook, but I haven't as in created it yet. As a resident, I don't feel like I'm there yet that I should really be really branding myself. I think when, when I'm going to actually be an attending, I think that those are things I will explore, but not yet. Um, I'm very active on Twitter um, because I feel that that's a very comfortable format for me. Um, uh, Instagram, I have, I'm not as active on it when using it. Um, and I've really taken to Clubhouse in the last two or three months. I've really enjoyed that. And I think when you're looking at what social media to use on a personal level, and we started talking about this before we came on, I think you have to find what fits your personality and your style. Personally, I'd rather talk than 
you know, just take a picture or, or video of myself, like in TikTok. I'm not comfortable with that. And it's something that I don't think I do as well as other people. So I'll let other people do that. And I'll focus on, you know, I was talking with a couple bigger social media doctors that I've met through other, other social media outlets. And, you know, they said, if you're a talker, usually Twitter works for you because it, it kind of correlates to you doing like podcasts or clubhouse or so you kind of have to cater to your personality and it's not a one size fits all kind of thing you can shine on one and not do as well on another and it's kind of molding to how you want to do it and what's great is there's so many options so you really have a good opportunity to kind of find that fit awesome thank you my pleasure let me find out okay so not all is well in the world of social media. In fact, the same group of authors, uh, we all published in BJUI, we looked at the drawbacks of social media usage for practicing urologists. And some of the highlights is still, you know, virtually almost 90% of urologists are on social media. So we're all slaves to our phones already. That bad Wi-Fi, the battery dying, it's the scariest thing that we can think of. But, you know, we're all prisoners. And at the same time, there was also concern. We found 6.1% of attending urologists, practicing urologists, met criteria for a social media disorder. Uh, well, I'll go into the specifics of what that criteria is later on. Uh, obviously, there is this other concern, online bullying. In fact, almost 18% of our practicing urologists said that they had been harassed by other physicians on social media. And 17% of urologists said that they had actually faced, experienced negative repercussions of social media activity that they have been in on. And not here is a very important topic that Dr. Loeb has knows a lot about is misinformation. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation online with regards to medicine and uh, especially in urological topics that Dr. Loeb has done a wonderful job of discussing. So uh, there are concerns, but that leads us to our study. Now, we wanted to perform a global survey assessing the role of and attitudes towards media platforms amongst training urologists. We know that practicing urologists, urologists are using them and anecdotally as a resident, I know that I'm using the apps. I'm using all of these things to improve myself. Let's see how everyone else was doing. And in order to do this, we distributed a 21 item online survey on social media and other media platforms to current urology trainees by email via individual institutions and multiple urological associations. Um, the survey acquired data, including baseline characteristics, the role of and attitudes towards social media and other media platforms in training, and we assess the prevalence of social media disorder based on the validated nine item social media disorder scale. So if you look here, this is the nine item social media disorder scale. If you say yes to five or more of this criteria, you are considered to be at risk for social media disorder. And it's important that, you know, you, I want you to take note of the criteria, preoccupation, tolerance, withdrawal, persistence, displacement, problems, deception, escape, and conflict. I want you to think about these because it's gonna come back later on, I wanna mention in our discussion. Um, with regards to the results of our study, we had 300- Hey, Justin, real quick before we get into the results, if we can back it up one slide sure, here. Sure, sure. We're gonna talk a lot about you know the results and, and some discussion points today, but let's talk about how you come up with this global team to do this survey. And how, what is the process for getting this approved through societies to send it out and to get it approved to post on social media platforms? So this one specific, we actually didn't really post on social media platforms. Uh, this was via mostly emails through the uh, urolo urological institutions across the world. And basically it was me uh, uh, reaching, working with Dr. Loeb and Dr. Ramasamy and Dr. Tio and Dr. Rivas and kind of seeing who we knew uh, across the world who would be interested in this project. We got the IRB approved here at the University of Miami. There's no personal health information. There, so, and it's all anonymous anyway. So I don't think there's any, there was really no HIPAA concerns. 
Uh, and basically it was us emailing through friend, like Dr. Loeb would put me in touch with an, uh, with one of the urologists, Dr. Tio would, and I would, you know, CC them and, you know, you have to ask in order to, ask, in order to work together, you have to be willing to kind of ask if someone wants to collaborate. And I think the one thing that's always drawn me to urology and is that urologists are awesome people for the most part, you know, everyone's going to want to collaborate. Everyone's going to work together. And we had people, you know, this was, it was really, really an awesome experience that I never thought I would be talking with someone in Africa about how they use social media. And that's a really interesting thing. And uh, I got to talk to some really cool people. And I think all it takes is uh, an opportunity for someone and hopefully they'll say yes. And, uh, you know, we did a couple Zoom calls. It was hard to get everyone together, but we were able to do a couple Zooms where we were all talking. Hard to set a time, obviously, because there's different uh, time zones and everything. But, you know, I think we got a really good reputation working together and we were able to publish multiple papers together because of it. So awesome. So what I'm hearing is using yeah. digital platforms has allowed you to build these truly global research teams. Dr. Loeb, anything to add? Oh, I just thought it maybe was worth highlighting that I met Justin through social media, you know, and I'm an attending in New York City and he's a resident in Florida and we have numerous joint publications and that's a, a common story that you see happening. So I think that right there, you know, is a testament to the power of these networks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's important to have, have great mentors like Dr. Loeb, who's willing to take the time out of her busy schedule to, to have a conversation with me. You know, the first time I reached out, she said, here, let's get on the phone and talk. And that was just an incredible, uh, I really appreciated it, you know, so um, it's, it's, you were lucky that, or I'm lucky that I have people like Dr. Loeb, Dr. Ramasamy, you know, Dr. Rivas, all these people, Dr. Tio, these were all very, been very helpful and, and really great mentors in, in getting this kind of research done. Yeah. And I think the other point too, for any trainees that are on the call is, you know, if you're at an institution where perhaps you don't have, you know, the type of mentorship that maybe you're looking for, or maybe you have a lot of great mentors, but they don't have the same research interests that you do, is utilizing social media to reach out to those mentors. I've um, had a great experience of being a mentor for people at other institutions. And so the reality is there are no boundaries. And I think the pandemic highlighted that fact out of necessity, having to create some of these global networks. Absolutely. I actually got, you know, during COVID, during this whole match process, um, John Hurd, who is a uh, med student in New York, but now he's going to Cedars as a resident, he just reached out to me, uh, wanted, came up with this project regarding social media and the match. And, you know, we went with it and Dr. Loeb's on board and, you know, we have a manuscript. We just were submitting a manuscript like this week. And I never knew John Hurd, but he came, he, he reached out to me via social media, had an awesome idea and we went with it. And I think that, you know, you have to be willing to give back, right? Like if I'm reaching out to people and they're willing to listen to me, I think that everyone should be comfortable reaching out to whoever because you should be paying it forward. So I think that's, it's a lot of it. All right. So should I continue? All right. So the results. So we had 372 responders, about 15% response rate from six different continents. I don't think anyone lives in Antarctica. Otherwise, we would have really tried to do it. Um, the majority of the respondents were from South America, North America, and Europe. Um, and this is a big table of a lot of the results of our paper. Um, but I kind of highlighted a couple that I thought were important. 99.4% um, of residents were using social media. 11.3% met criteria for social media addiction. Uh, 20% received instruction by their institution and department on professional social media use, and 65% have not reviewed professional social media guidelines. Also, just so you know, 85% of residents were using uh, guideline apps. The top three apps were the EAU, the AUA, and up to, eight, up to date. 
and 67% of urology residents felt it was important to continue to, to, to have a social media presence. Uh, I did a quick breakdown of North America versus non-North America trainees. Uh, North American trainees were listening more to healthcare focused podcasts, about 50%, um, 85% uh, uh, more, but all pretty much all most residents, no matter where they're from, thought that the, these kinds of apps were important to very important in their education. And uh, even worse, North America, 21%, only 21% had reviewed the social media guidelines. That's even less than, you know, the 65. So uh, discussion. I think that's a good uh, point to maybe pull up the results of our polls. What do you think? Yeah, let's see. Do we have right, the results? Uh, results? I have to unshare for a second. How does this work? Oh, so awesome. here we go. How do you receive social media? It's kind of close, right? So we said 20% in ours, this was 75% said that they had not. Uh, have you reviewed the AUA guidelines? 80% have not. So that's even worse. That's in line with the American, North America ones. Uh, do you think that social media usage should be a formally trained aspect? 95%. And now we're looking at our data and only 20% have received instruction. And then do you think it's our physician's responsibility to be active online to combat misinformation? Uh, overwhelming majority said yes. And this is interesting. Do you have, do you have or plan on using a digital strategist for social media? I, did, I included this one because this is something that I've been thinking about. And it's something that I've seen a lot of people now who are going from residency to attending level or fellowship to attending level have started to do, but that's 50-50. So that's very interesting. And I think it's something that we can discuss later on because uh, uh, people do have a limited time amount. And if it's important to you, maybe you can get some help. That's my thought process on that. So very interesting. It's pretty much in line with, with what we have here. So that's cool. That was a great time to bring it up. And uh, just to further the discussion about our results, and it kind of goes in line to what those re poll results. Virtually all trainees are using social media, but more than half uh, haven't reviewed the guidelines. And 80% here today haven't reviewed the guidelines. And most have not received instruction by their institution. So it seems like there's a disconnect, right? We have literally everyone on social media, pretty much attendings and trainees. We know that attendings have already, who have used it less, have actually experienced negative uh, issues with it. And yet we have these trainees and we're not helping them learn how to properly use it so that they don't have issues in the future. Um, so there's a disconnect that really I think needs to, to be fixed. Now looking at social media disorder, the, res the trainees have almost two times higher rates of social media disorder than attendings, 11.3 versus 6.1. When you're looking at these numbers, it, usually it's hard to compare studies, but because we did both studies and we use the same exact uh, you know, cat uh, survey questions, I think it's a fair way to compare these. And when you're looking at why, I mean, it's not surprising. I think social media has been used more by young people. It's probably incorporated more in their personal lives. But when we're looking at burnout, urology has the highest rates of burnout. And when we're looking at those nine items that I discussed before, preoccupation, tolerance, withdrawal, persistence, displacement, problems, deception, escape, conflict, they, there's an overlap there with things of burnout, right? So are we using social media too much actually that it's contributing to this burnout? I don't have any proof of this, but it's just something to think about. Overall, the risk of social media disorder is too damn high. Uh, there are mixed sentiments towards the role of social media when dealing with patients. You know, that came to our survey. The most people felt like they had a responsibility to be online, combat misinformation. But one of the biggest concerns uh, that our trainees showed was their, the challenge of physician authority that often comes, you know, with an increased sense of, you know, education by the, of the patient when they have all this information at their, fit, their, their fingertips, but there also is misinformation. So those are things that, that we're still fighting and, and we need to continue to discuss. Uh, limitations, I mentioned 15% response rate. 
It may not be an accurate response representation of all training urologists, of course, um, but this it's actually in line with similar similar uh, surveys, 15%. Ideally, you want to get around at over 10. Uh, there is an inherent voluntary and non-response bias, of course. It could suggest that there's an over overrepresentation here in our data of the role of social media in trainees because people who you know voluntarily were felt strongly about it were were responding. So in conclusion, despite practically all urology trainees using social media and guideline apps, the majority have not reviewed or have not been educated on professional guidelines for social media. There's a small but significant number of trainees who are at risk for social media disorder, which may be contributing to the higher rates of burnout among urologists. Thank you. I, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Perlman. Thank you, Stacey, Dr. Loeb. Uh, and I want to spe give a special thanks to the whole international team that helped conceptualize, distribute this survey with a special thanks to Dr. Ramasamy, Dr. Atran Gomez, Dr. Tio, Dr. Rivas, and of course, Dr. Loeb. And these are all the ways you can find me. Like I said, I'm on those social medias, not on TikTok. It'll take a lot for me to get on TikTok. Probably won't do it. Dr. Dr. Perlman can talk to you guys about TikTok. <laughs> Awesome, Justin, thank you so much for presenting. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing there. My pleasure. Awesome. All right, so from the group, um, and you can put your audio on and feel free to chime in. All right, is anyone surprised by the findings of this journal paper? Anyone surprised? Oh, cool, we're having everyone here. I'm starting to see names. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, I'm not surprised by the fact that everyone's on it. And I'm not surprised by the fact that it's helping all these trainees. You know, like I said, I have a firsthand experience as a trainee. I'm on these apps all the time. You know, I'm using not only AUA, I'm using, you know, Hippocrates, I'm using the doximity to call people uh, anonymously. There's so much utility in helping our, our, you know, facilitate everything that we're doing. We're busy. We want easy access. We want, you know, a breakdown of ways to easily get information and it's right at our fingertips. So of course we're using it. Yeah. Dr. Loeb, I want to get your insight on a few points here and you've used various platforms on uh, to create your digital footprint, whether it's radio, your website, Twitter, and um, so we're told, you know, through different guidelines and maybe at our institutions, what not to do when it comes to creating our digital footprint. What would it take to teach people how to do it well? I mean, I think we just have to start somewhere and even just some hands on workshops. I mean, I really think it's just time to maybe reconceive medical education from the beginning. You know, when I think back to what were the required pre-med courses that I had to take in college, uh, like I really can't say that some of these chemistry and physics things that I learn have any relevance whatsoever to my day-to-day -day life now. And, you know, why are we not having people who are majoring in communications and, you know, the things that I actually need, which is being able to talk to patients about sensitive topics and make sure that they can make an informed decision about their care or to share the results of our research with a broader community. And all of these things really require communications, which is such a very small part of the education that we receive all along the way. So I think this is just a, a parcel of this problem. And as Justin said, it's just amazing to see the disconnect between how everyone uses them, but yet there's virtually no didactic experience related to this extremely ubiquitous phenomenon. Yeah. Now, as a pioneer in social media, where you're involved in so many of these different channels, take us back a few years. How did you initially get started? Well, I first got started with Twitter because I was giving a lecture in Australia about prostate biopsy complications and 
Declan Murphy was live tweeting the lecture and there came in some questions over Twitter from Canada, which they then read off to me on the podium. And I just thought, you know, this is either really creepy or really cool that somebody in Canada is basically following my conversation in Australia in real time. So, and you know, they basically called me a dinosaur because I was the youngest and I wasn't on Twitter and all of these Australian and Canadian urologists were already doing this. So I was, I guess, uh, you know, shamed slash intrigued to give this whole thing a try and that really spiraled. Um, so that's definitely been the main focus of my social media use for the purpose of urology. But I think uh, different platforms have advantages and disadvantages. So it's just important to consider what your own goals are and where the audience is that you're trying to reach. And as Justin said, what medium you are the most comfortable with. You know, the nice thing about something like Clubhouse is if you enjoy having the personal connection and talking to people, but you want to do that on your couch in pajamas, then that might be more comfortable than doing something like YouTube where you're on the video. So I think it really just depends. You know, TikTok is really much younger audiences. Uh, I consider doing that, but it really just doesn't reach the target population who I'm trying to reach, but that is not the case for others if they're, you know, doing more stuff that's targeted to um, young adults, for example. So I think all these things are to consider, but regardless, I think just having at least a minimal footprint on as many networks as possible is very important for search engine optimization. So you know, I have a professional Facebook page. I post to it very rarely, but I keep it there and it is just a placeholder. So there's really no harm to just having, you know, your LinkedIn profile populated, having a professional Facebook page, stick something on there when you have something to share, but it's, it won't do any harm and it might help a lot in terms yeah. of you controlling the narrative of your own digital footprint, because we all have one. So are you in control or is everybody else in control? Awesome. And you also have um, your own website. And if you don't mind, if you want to share your screen and, and show the group what that website looks like and, and how you use the different pages of that website to help organize your own publications for work that you do, whether or not you direct patients to your site, how you upload, you know, recent media events that you've done. And I think part of that, you know, perhaps the answer of we're told how not to do it, how do we do it, is finding good resources like this online for people to maybe model some of their websites after. So if you want to take us through. Okay, well, thank you. I was surprised when you asked me about this because nobody has ever brought it up to me on an academic call, but it has been helpful for keeping myself organized and for patients and other purposes. So, I mean, I really just kind of made up a design with a web designer, you know, with some basics on the first page that lead to some of these other menus. Uh, so, you know, the about page just gives a summary of my bio and you can download my CV, pictures of mentors, my educational background, board certifications, etc. And then uh, the next page is my clinical practice locations with, you know, mapping information and phone numbers so that patients can find me. The next section is more of the academic section where I tabulated all of my publications by topic. And, you know, here's where I just thought it's important to communicate what I thought were the key papers in each topic. So this was just PSA screening. And if you click on it, then I discuss the key papers with a summary of the findings and then a list of all the other papers and they have links out. So if somebody wants to go through to it, they can, but for the most important ones, I provided 
you know, a summary of the information. So I think you know, did you, did you, to uh, me if sorry, you are planning you have, to apply for grants to have a place where uh, your publications are indexed by topic can be very helpful because people ask me for an NIH bio sketch. You know, somebody was submitting a grant with telemedicine and wanted me to be on it. So they wanted all my digital publications. So then I just literally like look at the topic copy paste that list of publications. So, I mean, it's actually even helpful to me just to stay organized, but it's also a place where you can share with patients everything that you've published related to a particular topic. Justin. Sorry about that. I apologize. Um, did you actually, were you the one who like wrote these things out or did you have someone design it for you? Cause it's, I, I agree with Dr. Perlman. It's amazing. I think this is brilliant. It's really cool way of navigating and everything. I mean, I just basically, you know, made up what I wanted and over time, you know, the web designer, I mean, she created the formatting in terms of like how many are listed per column and things like that, but I created all of the lists of publications and the, the summaries and everything like that. So, um, you know, I think that it's an easy way to display or you could adopt something similar if you want to showcase your work and, you know, really what you decide to focus on. So this was a section I added maybe like a year or so ago where I thought, well, what I really care about are my grants. And so, you know, why don't I have a section because that the, my grants and awards were just buried in another part of the website that I wasn't really giving a call out. But from an academic perspective, that is what I'm the most proud of. And so I thought, well, I should really have its own dedicated page. So I think you have to figure out what is it that you really want people to see about you and make sure that it's, it's evident. So, you know, I, that was a later addition, but I, I don't know, making sure that you're highlighting to people what you think matters. I guess there must have been some update or the map is, I'll have to, uh, this is the only one problem with websites is you do have to keep them updated. And I haven't been doing that as much during COVID because we just are all so preoccupied. But this is an interactive map with the lectures that I've done in various countries. Um, the, uh, oops, <laughs> the orange pins are English and the uh, green pins are Spanish lectures on the map. And so uh, it just, and then underneath they're all indexed with where was the lecture and the dates and the topic that I lectured on. And each pin, you know, if you click on it has pictures with, you know, the hosts and other people. So it's quite a detailed section there on uh, lectures. Um, and then this section is on media. So um, some of the lectures that I've given are on YouTube or in some other interviews. So you can click on these menus to get you know, a list of various presentations or watch the videos which are embedded in here. So, I mean, this isn't necessarily the, the best possible format. There's also a section for blog where I can put posts and a contact section and people do sometimes reach out to me through this and it just comes to my email. Um, and all of this is hosted through WordPress. So, I mean, you did just see one problem where when there is a WordPress update, sometimes there's a glitch like with the interactive map. Um, but, you know, by and large, I mean, WordPress is not that difficult to use. So you can probably with minimal instruction, figure out how to make some updates yourself or just periodically pay a small fee to a web designer to have them post the updates that you have curated. Awesome, thank you very much for taking us through your website. We have a, a great question. Um, Dr. Loeb, how do you see the impact and crosstalk between your own website and other common social media platforms? Are you communicating between, you know, your Twitter and your website? Or I think, as you mentioned, like you really use your website, not even to, you know, build your practice, but really more so for your own organization. So maybe less crosstalk. I mean, I think you could 
have as much or as little as you want. When I initially planned the website, I planned to, to really focus on the blog. And I planned to tweet out links to the blog post on my website. But then, you know, Twitter itself really exploded and I became engaged in a lot of projects there. Um, like I run the PCF Prostate Cancer Journal Club every month with the PCF and I'm doing a bunch of other accounts on both Twitter and Instagram behind the scenes. And so I just never ended up having time to dedicate to becoming a blogger. So therefore that section just didn't really come to fruition and there's less crosstalk. But yes, I think crosstalk is great and should be used as much as possible. So there are some apps where you can cross post content to different places. Um, and so, you know, for example, if something important happens, I can use one of these apps to post it to my Twitter, Facebook, you know, all the same post without having to go on each platform and do it separately. And there's a whole bunch of these organizational tools. So um, I like Buffer, but other people use different platforms and you can just link your accounts to one of these social media managers. But yes, I think if you have more than one place, if you have a blog, then definitely, you know, post about it to all your other social networks. And if you make YouTube videos, then tweet them out, post them to Facebook, put them on your website. So as much as possible, if you can reach different audiences through these different channels. Mm -hmm. What is, and I want to direct this to, you know, um, both you and Justin and really anyone on the webinar tonight. Um, you know, we've all reached our own challenges and barriers in the process of, of creating our digital footprint. What is your advice for the group? Any advice or, or what did you wish that you would have known maybe three, four years ago when starting out on some of these platforms? And Dr. Lowe, we'll start with you. I mean, I think you can never start too early and just networking with other people is really important where I've seen people go wrong is if it's all just a one way stream, you know, it's very nice to shout out your friends and like other people's posts and, and so I think as much as possible, having it be very interactive and using it as a way to make a lot of new friends and connections in the field. Awesome. And uh, Justin? Um, I agree with Dr. Loeb. Um, I think one thing that when you're on social media, I think for the trainees, at least, I think the first thing you should absolutely do I act, uh, is take your name, find out any social media and make it your account. You don't necessarily have to use it. But, you know, there was a couple of situations where I think I wasn't able to get it, but then I kind of like was persistent and I found out a way to get like my name, because I think when, especially like there's a lot of doctors who have like John Smith as their name, it's not easy. So you kind of, I think you really need to, one thing that I was like all over at first with like different names for different social medias. And I think that consistency is a key. A, it's easier for you. Um, to just remember everything and B it's easier for whoever you're interacting with, whether it's pro other professionals, whether it's patients, if they know that there's one way to identify you in all social media, they're going to like, if they think about your Twitter, but they want to look for you on Instagram and they, and your name is not the same, how will you expect them to find you? You, you won't. Um, or, and that goes with anyone trying to network. Right. So I think it goes back to what Dr. Loeb said before, like, when you create your own narrative, you you can start early with residency, not necessarily like if you're not comfortable being as much as you want to be, maybe later on, that's okay. But at least establish to some degree where you are in all these social media formats. So at least you can go ahead later on and 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 you have those to fall back on. Because sometimes you know, you wait too long. Like Dr. Loeb said, you want to get in earlier. I would love to have done everything earlier. If you wait too long, you kind of miss a lot of it. And I think the early adopters are the ones who often benefit the most. 
Yeah, you know, and in that respect, as urologists in general, we're early adopters and innovators of new technology. So almost by, you know, the people who are attracted to the field of urology, we should really be on the forefront of creating our digital footprint. I was pleasantly surprised with a grand rounds talk I gave this morning to uh, my urology department on social media. Uh, they're used to hearing me talk about chronic scrotal content pain. So I think it surprised them a little bit when I chose this topic. But I was pleasantly surprised to see some people in, you know, maybe uh, mid career asking about, hey, well, what have some of your barriers been? Do you reach barriers with, with the marketing communications people when it comes to posting videos? And hey, what about VidScript? Is that free? How do I do that? How do I get in contact with those people? And, um, you know, we talk about social media and some of the, the negative sides of it. And, and I would say, in my life and being in practice in two and a half years, it's probably saved my career and led to decreased burnout. And I, I feel pretty confident in saying that. My first slide of um, my presentation today was a copy and paste of uh, an HPI of a typical gentleman that I see in the office. And it was a guy coming in with erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, chronic scrotal content pain, low libido, and something, uh, what else was he coming in? Oh, LUTs. And, um, and because a lot of us do, you know, quality of life concerns that affect men, all these things, it's like, well, none of these things are gonna kill my patient. And as much as I would love to tell that gentleman, hey, Bill, you know, choose the most important thing that you want to discuss today because I have another patient to see at eight and two others at 8.15 and one at 8.30 and another at 8.45 and three at nine o'clock. So you have about, oh, your visit's over, right? Um, and it's, you can't really say it for those five concerns because they're all related. I can't figure out how to treat your Peyronie's unless I figure out how I'm going to treat your ED and I can't figure out how I'm going to treat your pelvic floor dysfunction and your or your testicular pain and your LUTs without understanding is this pelvic floor dysfunction, your low libido, God forbid you mention that, you know, then we have to go into the whole testosterone discussion and how that affects ED. And the reality is it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And I love those conversations, but they were burning me out when you have to do that several times a day. And so what this digital platform has allowed me to do is to say to someone like Bill, Bill, all of your concerns are really important. And you know, we're going to address a few of them today. But if I go into the nitty gritty details of all the different ways I can treat each one, your eyes will glaze over. This is not my first rodeo. And um, you don't even understand why these things are happening, much less what you want to do about it. And that's OK. We're just going to talk today. In fact, I expect that you are going to forget 99% of what we discuss. That's OK, too. We're going to talk about the basics. I'm going to give you my YouTube channel link and some additional videos and perhaps written content. And, and, and the reality is we don't even have to create all of our own content. I mean, I could easily direct people to Dr. Loeb's website and say, why don't you check out her PSA screening guidelines? She's already done the work. And I know more than anyone else, Dr. Loeb is reliable and has gone through that research and vetted it. Why do I need to do that as well? I don't. I just have to find the reliable resources for my patients, but it's an exit strategy. And, and we all need that exit strategy to say, all of your concerns are important. I'm not going to fix you today. Right now, I'm just learning about you. You're going to go home and learn some more at home. When you come back, I want you to ask me some good questions. But when patients don't understand what's going on, they can't come up with the questions because you have to know a little bit of the basics in order to come up with those questions. And, um, so it, it's helped me feel, uh, I'm in fetal position a less percentage of the time after my clinic because I can, um, because I can direct people for some additional content. Anybody else from the group who's used things like YouTube to help educate their patients? And I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot, as a facilitator, end this webinar without someone saying something. <laughs> Anybody, any thoughts here? Let's see, chat, anything in the chat? Nothing. 
Um, okay. Any, um, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's actually an excellent session and I was quiet in the background, but so I think a lot of us use YouTube to educate our patients. Dr. Loeb has done a lot of work on this. We've done some work showing that one of the issues is that unless you direct the patients to the correct sites, there, there is a lot of misinformation. So I think it's important to use YouTube, but also to guide your patients to the better YouTube sites, which are often the ones that that have physician involvement, uh, as opposed to those that uh, that are that are done by either lay people or sometimes even uh, by by the industry. Um, so I think it's a very powerful tool, but we have to use it properly. Uh -huh. I think that's yeah. a great comment and just so important for us to be proactive. Oh, I think she cut out there. I think we lost her. We lost her. Maybe she'll come back. <laughs> um, let's see. It was very well done, though, guys. It was a very good job. It was an excellent webinar. All right. Hey, Dr. Loeb, are you back? I'm back. I just think it's great for us to be proactive because since, uh, you know, People are very likely to stumble across misinformation if left to the native search filter. So uh, just having in mind for the main topics that you see, what are some reliable online resources where people should look and actually providing that information because we all recognize that there's limited time in the clinical encounter. And so it's natural that patients are going to want to find more information somewhere else. So instead of just leaving them to do that on their own and risk what they might find, it's very nice. So, you know, some of my favorites for prostate cancer are like the PCF patient guide is really excellent and it's a free download. And the Urology Care Foundation has a bunch of excellent patient education materials about a variety of urological topics. So if you just keep you know, an index of some of these resources at hand, you know, or as Amy said, if you want to be a content creator, then figure out what topics your patients are gonna want and need more information. And if that type of information that they need or that you wanna share is not out there, then make some videos and then you can share that and, and it probably will be helpful to a lot of people. Yeah. And the other thing too, is I'll ask my patients what they think about certain videos. And, and a lot of my male patients, I mean, they'll give me the real scoop. They'll, they'll tell me you spoke too fast or, um, you know, they'll give me the, the re actually the best advice I ever get is, is from my patients. Um, and when I was preparing my grand rounds for earlier today, I, I thought of this acronym and I kind of want to vet it with the group um, in terms of, you know, when it, when it comes to finding your own voice in building your digital footprint. And I came up with the acronym VOICE and I want to explain it to everyone. So V is for vulnerability. And I think all of us on this call can understand that putting our content out there, whether it's our face, our voice or, written or, or our written word makes us vulnerable. And some people are gonna like what we have to say and what we have to post. And some people might hate it and the majority probably couldn't care. In fact, they probably couldn't care less. And I think all of us are okay with any one of those scenarios, but there is some vulnerability, but also a confidence in the fact that we have something important to say, however it is that we say it. Ownership of the way that we, um, uh, that we do that in the best way. I would say for me, when it comes to audio, I'm not a huge fan of me on audio. I'm so passionate about what I do that when you don't see the smile with the passion, it comes off as aggression. <laughs> and, um, but on, on video, I think you can see more of that enthusiasm and that I'm not such a scary person, but I also like to show demo products. So if I have a vacuum pump, I'll hold it up and I'll do a demo with penile injection therapy. And that's where video can be really helpful for me. As Justin mentioned, he likes the, the audio and the written word. And so he really shines with things like Clubhouse and Twitter. 
Um, and then instruments. So if we decide that we're going to do something like a podcast, then we need to make sure we're setting ourselves up for success. We need good Wi-Fi. We need good sound. Dr. Loeb, you know, has a studio for her Sirius XM, and she probably couldn't run that type of operation from her laptop computer, right? And that is a professional production, which requires professional equipment. And that requires some type of investment, depending on the type of audience you want to reach collaboration, which could not have been sort of emphasized, I think, any more than we did in this project. I met Justin during an sms &A meeting when we went to a Boston Scientific sponsored uh, sort of small group session on social media. I reached out to Justin through Twitter to get Dr. Loeb's email. And that's how something like this came about. And they've built these global research teams simply by reaching out to each other digitally. And I think sometimes we group all of this stuff under that heading of social media, when perhaps more so it's a digital platform. And, and I think maybe some people might be maybe more comfortable with that because digital means really anything. I mean, it's a, maybe a broader definition, I'm not sure, but so many, there's no excuse, I think, in today's day and age why we can't reach out to anyone at, at anywhere around the world uh, to collaborate on any type of initiative. And then experience, I think all of us has have failed in, in one way, shape or form. My, my mother is on this call tonight and my mother knows more than anyone else that sometimes she is the only person who shows up for some of my events. But if I get my mother and one other person on that call, I'm gonna count that as a win. And in part, because I know my mother has friends and I know her friends wanna know this information. And I know my, that my dad is in my prime patient demographic. And so maybe instead of my dad, maybe not feeling comfortable talking to someone like me about these issues, he'll say, hey, Susan, what did you learn tonight? And then maybe my mother will pull up a, a recording of a video that I did. And perhaps my dad will then feel comfortable reaching out to his urologist. So um, thank you all so much for joining us on tonight's webinar through SMSNA and our educational committee. Uh, we're doing these on a monthly basis, various topics. I had an awesome time and learned so much from the good Drs. Dubin and Loeb. Any other summary uh, take-home points from the group? It looks like we have a hand raised oh. and a question if, we're, if there's time. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Have you dealt with institutional rules about ownership of content you create? Some institutions have clauses that state they own whatever content you create. Dr. Loeb, if you want to start us off there. So I have had to work with the institution when running institutional related accounts. And so in that case, it would be very important to make sure that it's allowed to run an account for your department, for example, and, you know, things like the logo have to be uh, controlled by the institution. So there's a bit more oversight. Uh, they have not um, ever come after me over stuff that I am posting to my own accounts under my name. And I think, in fact, it's part of our social media policy that you have to write, you know, posts my own or, you know, personal opinion, not the voice of my institution. You know, you're actually supposed to have a clause like that on your profile, which disassociates that content from the institutional position. So I guess it depends on what you're posting. Yeah. And, and I, I think a lot of us, whenever I see healthcare providers on something like Twitter, it says, you know, like tweets my own, for example. Um, I would say the way that I use YouTube and a lot of my um, the social media platforms I use is um, I don't brand the university from with which I work. I'm Amy Perlman. I'm a urologist and a men's health specialist. And today we're going to talk about premature ejaculation. So for these these uh, educational you know content videos where I'm doing them uh, for things that are not supported by the university, I'm not at the University of Iowa. And and part of that is because I don't want. I don't want to run into any issues, you know, and I when I was giving the grand rounds this morning, I had a colleague ask a question like, oh, okay, so you're bypassing marketing and going around them and creating this stuff. And I said, 
no, I'm not doing that at all. I'm actually, I'm not doing anything illegal. I, I'm not doing anything illegal. My name is Amy Perlman. I'm allowed to have a YouTube channel and I'm educating patients. And, and if that's illegal, then fine, take me to court. I don't know what to say. But yeah, I think it all depends on your goals. And if you're in private practice, it's going to be easier to use websites to direct patients to your practice. I don't use my online you know, pages to direct patients to the University of Iowa, but I also understand that if people like my message, they'll find where I work and they'll schedule an appointment. So there are ways to certainly you know, go around that. People will find you and they'll find a way to make an appointment. Awesome. All right, well, we are gonna end our webinar, webinar there. Y'all have a great night. Thank you so much for this. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was great. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you.